Hey there, folks. This is Kevin Madison from Project Dragonfly. I hope you enjoy this podcast about Dragonfly community members doing inspiring work. If you have ideas for a guest or want to be more involved in this podcast, please feel free to directly email me. Thanks again for listening and enjoy the episode. This week, I spoke with Trevor Mia. Trevor works at the Alligator Farm in Florida. He's been there six years and has worked as a curator, um, working on programs in conservation and education that reach the greater St. John's County and North Florida communities. He is an avid ocean enthusiast. He paddle boards, kayaks, snorkels, dives, and he is a graduate of uh, Suwannee, the University of the South, and also Miami University's Project Dragonfly. Um, he was in the Global Field Program, and we talk about his travels on various Earth expeditions, also how he has engaged the community in Florida through his work at the Alligator Farm and also through his work with the AZA. Um, and he also gives a lot of tips on how to connect with the AZA, how to get more involved, and how to do assessment and evaluation. We talk about that a little bit. So there's some tips that might be of value to a variety of individuals. So uh, without further ado, enjoy this conversation with Trevor, Mia. All right, Trevor, thanks for joining the podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here. Nice. So um, yeah, we were talking about before we hit record about starting off with um, your connections with the AZA. We just met up in person in Columbus for the annual meeting. Um, and then you work with the alligator farm. And of course, also your work with uh, Dragonfly and the GFP. So it's a huge question, but just, I guess the first thought is like, how has that been for you in the intersection of all those, those items? It's really fantastic to be able to work with these different communities. Um, like you said, the Alligator Farm, the St. Augustine, Florida community, the broader reach of AZA uh, and all, everything that AZA does, both nationally and internationally. And then, of course, Dragonfly, um, those international contacts as well. Um, there really is a whole lot of intersect and overlap between the people you meet, the work that is being done, um, and, you know, the work that we hope to accomplish moving into the future. Uh, as you said, you know, it was fantastic seeing you at Columbus and having a graduate get together uh, at that, you know, one hotel uh, bar right before the icebreaker of AZA and seeing so many familiar faces that I honestly didn't even know were in the program uh, or had connections to the Dragonfly program, but I had known them from another community. Uh, so it's really cool having that intersect or seeing how our worlds just really are so interconnected. Totally. And I know you were involved with at least one session. Um, uh, do you want to talk about that? Or And yeah. also, do you have a specific role in AZA that you're involved in? Or is it, you know, what what is your connection there? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, so at Columbus, I assisted with the uh, redefining uh, educator competencies session. So that was an earlier session in the week in which uh, it was definitely over 100 educators or 100 um, members of the AZA community that went into a discussion on what does it truly mean to be an educator at our facilities, at our institutions, and the work that we are doing. And you know, it's spearheaded by Dr. Kathy and Khalil, who is uh, a professor uh, through the Dragonfly program uh, and other familiar names um, like Joe Heimlich um, or uh, Elise uh, Berndoni. Um, so there's a lot of um, really common names or uh, familiar names within. Yeah, I think yeah. Dave Johnson as well was involved, but didn't make it out to AZA. But yeah, he couldn't make it out. Session. He got stuck in the New York, uh, the New York rain. Right. Uh, this week. So there were a few from the Bronx uh, that yeah. weren't able to make it out. But we really sat down and mapped out what it is to be, again, an educator. Uh, so we separated, uh, you know, all the work that we do into five main buckets or categories spanning from uh, conservation capacity building all the way to being um, being safe on our properties. You know, we work with um, a myriad of different animals that can be 
dangerous. And so it's not only uh, the safety of working with those animals, but offering a safe place for our community members and our youth uh, to call home. Uh, so that educator competency session went extremely well. We're going to have a follow-up. Uh, we actually conducted a few follow-ups already uh, with some of our smaller communities. Uh, I'll go into that uh, probably in a little bit. Um, and we hope to eventually publish some sort of paper um, or expose that you know talks about the work that we as educators um, or the education community does for our zoos and aquariums and why it is so critical to our functions as zoos and aquariums. Uh, so that was one of the sessions I assisted with and I thoroughly enjoyed um, being a part of uh, my work with AZA. So I am on the executive team of the Conservation Education Committee. Uh, and so I work with the Education Advisors Initiative and the Professional Development um, Cluster within that community. Uh, we for the Education Advisors Initiative, we are linking with other education advisors who assist with this uh, species of excuse me, uh, species survival plans, uh, the saving animals from extinction plans, um, and then our tax and tax on advisory groups as well. So we're connecting those uh, educators with resources that they can use to better promote their own uh, species, their own um, animals that they are building communities for. Uh, and then the professional development cluster, I work with the um, conservation learning teams. So I'm a core instructor on the conservation learning team uh, that is now hosting courses at Leesburg, Virginia. It was previously at Wheeling. Uh, and I don't know if uh, you know much about Wheeling, but AZA had hosted courses in Wheeling, West Virginia for 40 plus years. Um, that time or that tenure has unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on who you are, uh, has come to an end. And we are now going to be hosting those courses at the National Conference Center in Leesburg. Uh, so I assist with running those courses and instructing on those. Uh, and then I also sit as a core instructor for the crocodilian biology and management course uh, hosted by AZA at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm. Okay, you are very busy, I can <laughs> tell. Um, yeah, a lot, so, okay. a, lot of, a lot of Zoom meetings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you know, but that's, it's all such important things. I mean, I know with the competencies, educational competencies you were talking about, the thing that struck me about the session, because I sat in briefly there, was the sense that during COVID, there were a lot of layoffs and sometimes from education staff and the desire to make it clear, you know, what are the key skills that educators have that um, should not be taken for granted when layoffs inevitably, you know, come on the horizon at different times due to different factors. Um, so I thought that was a great point of just professionalizing, further professionalizing the educational um, skills that people have in those departments. Um, so let's talk about your work at the Alligator Farm um, and Zoological Park. Like what what is your day to day? Uh, with the zoo and what is that like? Yeah, so day to day uh, for us is we have um, a, a lot of different programs that span throughout the the year, the months, the weeks, uh, and it really depends on the time or the season that we're in. Uh, so we're kind of ending our event season. I, I call it our event and professional development season because the fall is heavy, and as we all, as educators or the, us in the zoo and aquarium communities. Uh, know that, you know, this time of the year we have uh, professional development conferences like the AZA annual conference. Uh, we actually just recently hosted our Florida Association of Zoo Educators conference at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm. And that brings together, that brought together 13 different institutions from around the state of Florida and over 35 educators, where we uh, continue discussions on topics like the educator competencies, uh, or talking about, you know, ambassador animals and how we're utilizing um, our coworkers essentially uh, to help connect to the community uh, or talking about, you know, summer heat in Florida. What are we going to do next summer when it's inevitably uh, over a hundred degrees um, and we have campers from five to six years old to um, lifelong learners uh, joining our park that, you know, sometimes can't withstand those high temperatures. Uh, so, you know, we're doing a, a professional development opportunities like that for our staff and for our community, uh, while we're also hosting events like our trick-or-treating events at the zoo. Um, so we host like a three-day um, all-you-can-eat candy uh, 
uh, celebration uh, the week before Halloween, which is, um, you know, very popular with our community members, to um, hosting other, you know, adult events like Croctoberfest, which is a conservation uh, event, you know, meant to spread awareness about crocodilian uh, conservation and partnering with communities um, and breweries in our area uh, to help uh, promote their businesses as well. So, you know, the fall time for us is really heavy on um, those community-based uh, events while, you know, summertime is um, camp central, right? So we're, mm -hmm. we're kayaking, we're zip lining, we're um, rock climbing, we're uh, of course doing animal encounters and crafts with our, with our campers. Uh, we're on and off property visiting other camps and other programs uh, to bring them some of our ambassador animals so they can um, help gain empathy for the animals that are local to our area. Uh, right now, we're kind of rolling into our spring winter time where uh, it's a little bit slower. Uh, mm -hmm. I call this the the planning phase, right? So mm -hmm. we're getting to work on strategic planning and what is 2024 and beyond going to look like? Uh, what new programs are we going to bring on? How are we evaluating our previous programs that uh, we did run throughout this year? Um, Budgeting is a big one. You know, where where do we want to spend um, our resources for 2024, and how, what improvements do we want to make? Uh, so this time is you know great for being behind the computer and um, kind of focusing on um, that overarching planning, um, as opposed to the rest of the year where we're kind of go 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 um, with our community members, with our um, guests and visitors that are at the park. Right. Awesome. Whether well, the all you can eat um Halloween <laughs> candy <laughs> event uh piqued my interest. Uh I, I did hear on the news uh as as we got past Halloween, they said it, it is healthier to eat all your candy at once than to like eat it as you go each day. Save it, yeah. Just right. get it done with, get it <laughs> eat it all at once, and then right. get back into the gym. <laughs> right. Um very cool. And um, and then Croctoberfest, I mean, how do you like, how do you all approach that um, in terms of getting the info? I feel like in in Florida, there's always news of some sort of alligator um, conflict um, with pets, you know, sometimes more serious issues. I mean, what is that like trying to get people to care about crocodilians in, in Florida? Yeah, so we really um, rely on our partners uh, for this. So we've worked with Florida International University, uh, Matt Shirley and the work that he does over in West Africa, uh, University of North Florida, the Rosenblatt Lab and the work that they're doing uh, here in the state on evaluating um, American alligator populations. So we use the, the knowledge that they have gained over the years and try to put it into uh, manageable chunks for our community members. So they are you know, really understanding you know, what's going on both here at home, uh, but abroad as well in terms of crocodilians. Um, you know, we see, you know, here in the States, alligators are almost plentiful. Um, they are still, you know, a protected species, uh, but we've done an amazing job uh, in terms of government regulation of alligators and American crocodiles to allow them the space to flourish and have sustainable populations. Uh, so what we're trying to do with the Croctoberfest event is um, take you know the the things that our researchers and our um, our academic communities are doing to aid these species in um, establishing a space for them within their mm -hmm. own ecosystems, within their own habitats, bring that to our community members, tell them this is what's going on. Um, and then, you know, that builds empathy, uh, but also it can build financial support as well. Uh, so this right. event, we raise, you know, tens of thousands of dollars that we'll then, then give back to. Uh, so we actually don't take any of those proceeds for the alligator farm itself. We take it and we send it back out to our um NC2, XC2 partners, uh, so they can continue the work that they're doing. I know community-based conservation is a huge part of, you know, what Project Dragonfly um, preaches and teaches about. And so we try to take that community-based conservation and apply a little bit of that here at home, but more directly let others know that this is going on in different reaches of the world. So they can um, then take those steps to learn more if they want to, or even support um, in their own way. Right. I, lo I love a lot of things you said there, you know, the manageable chunks, the partnerships with the academic um, connections, and then also the learning from 
global um, efforts in West Africa, you you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then just really listening to the community, working with the community, um, because it is a complicated issue. And right now, we are in a unique time as conservationists where some species do have populations that are rebounding to some degree, not to say they're not still threatened, like, like you just mentioned with alligators, but they're rebounding. And so it's causing conflict. I mean, we see this also with um, Asian elephants and to some degree with African elephants, depending on where you are, where there can be some conflict with communities. So it's how do we coexist with these animals? How do, and, and alligators are a tough one, right? Um, to sell and just similar to elephants um, here yeah, in Ohio. Yeah. It's 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 deer is the worst thing we have. And it's that's that's relatively easy compared to the other two. Um, but yeah, it's it's you got to get creative, I think. So yeah, you got to get creative. And, you know, we and especially in the area of Florida, I mean, we've had, you know, such expanses in how we're developing our land. And so that, of course, is encroaching on that once, you know, protected land or maybe not protected, mm. but land that mm. was historically, you know, wild that now has, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 home developments on it. Right. And so it's going to those communities and really preaching backyard conservation. Uh, you know, what, so yes, you have this, you know, development or you have this home that has, you know, been historically maybe in a pine forest or an oak hardwood hammock. Uh, so what can you do in your own backyard to maybe attract some of the wildlife that previously had lived there or make it comfortable for them as well? And that's a lot of um, the work that I try to uh, integrate within my uh, master's studies um, with Dragonfly is finding out ways to create or uh, find out ways to uh, educate our community members on how to create those oasises for wildlife. Nice. I love it. Um, so let's talk about your time in Dragonfly. Um, so, you know, maybe you can just give us the, the overview of like the, the, the earth expeditions you went on and when you graduated and a little bit about your master plan, anything else you want to share about, um, your time with Dragonfly? Yeah, definitely. So I, you know, like most of us, um, went through the program in a very weird time. <laughs> I started mm -hmm. in 2019 uh, and then graduated in 2022. So I was right in the middle of that COVID era uh, time where you know travel restrictions were very heavy and prominent. So that definitely affected the areas I went in my focuses of study. Uh, I started off by going to Belize uh, and uh, that fan the fantastic program that they have going on down there. Uh, and then I spent, uh, I took a year off from travel. So 2020, I uh, didn't go anywhere. I uh, actually didn't take any of the courses because I knew that travel was one of the right. reasons totally I wanted shut to, down. Yep. Yeah, one of the reasons yeah. I wanted to take this course. So I opted not to take that um, connecting conservation course. Right. Uh, yep. And then um, <clears throat> continued my studies in the fall. I uh, went to Baja in 2021. Uh, and for those that have been to Baja. I don't have to say much more than that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So whale sharks and whales and dolphins are plenty. Um, and it was really great uh, learning from Megan and the work that she's doing there with the Venturados um, and how mm -hmm. she's connecting with that community. Uh, I was able to bring some tidbits back to our park to redevelop our zoo team program. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I finished off with a trip to the Galapagos, uh, which was hands down one of the best experiences I'll ever have in my life. Um, the Galapagos Isles are, you know, truly enchanted uh, from mm -hmm. their nickname. And the animal experiences there are um, unlike any other. I remember talking to my director before leaving and he had been to the Galapagos some years before. And he was saying, you know, and he's traveled around the world and, you know, experienced different cultures and animals. And he said, you know, this culture and these these individuals that are on this island, these species, you know, truly don't understand the human complex. And so you right. get there and they're not afraid of you. No. <laughs> um, and that really resonated with me when I, um, I can't remember the beach that I was at, but I was on one of the beaches and there was a blue footed booby there. And it was, man, just arm's distance away. And we just sat there within each other's presence and company um, <laughs> until I got bored. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and then moved on. Uh, and But, you know, those experiences uh, were felt with, mm -hmm. you know, sea turtles um, and the sea lions, the marine iguanas, of course, the tortoises, 
Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, the Glockos were just. In, in, yeah, um, I remember seeing sea lions just lounging on a park bench. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes it's, it's almost like a locations. welcome you get to the glockers yeah. and it's just a sea lion there hanging out <laughs> yeah just and it actually it's it's it is going back to that idea of coexistence it's like it's it's this is what it almost could be right but it's kind of yes. unique because it's it's from this evolution lack of an evolutionary co you know history with humans so they don't see us as a threat and they don't really see many things as a threat on those um, enchanted islands, as you say. Um, so it's just fascinating to see that behavior. Um, for me, it was it was hearing the Galapagos tortoises breathing and mm. their deep breathing that sounded like, you know, um, the size that we get. Like yeah, just <laughs> like like as close to being around a dinosaur as as I may ever have. Um, yes. Even though it's a mammal, it, it just just I mean, a, sorry, a tortoise. It's a, a, a reptile, but um, yeah, just absolutely amazing. And Baja and Belize, so, so great as well. Um, so um, cool. And what about your master plan and anything yeah. with your leadership challenges you want to share or publications that have come out of this? Yeah, definitely. Um, so <clears throat> uh, my master plan was focused on um, community conservation, specifically at the alligator farm and building up our programs um, to match the community itself. And so uh, there was... I. I kind of leaned into evaluation uh, pretty heavily within my master plan as I wanted to evaluate our communities to determine what programs would best fit their needs. Um, so it's almost that uh, I didn't lean very heavy into, into the co-design model um, as I was you know, really learning what the co-design model was during those studies. Um, but, you know, leaning into, you know, what do our community members or what do our teachers need in terms of their field trip programs and developing and curating a program for them. Um, and actually, we were able to, or have been able to even with the ups and downs of COVID uh, and, you know, the difficulty of getting students on property due to lack of buses or uh, travel restrictions have been able to establish a partnership with one of our local or a few of our local elementary schools where they come to the visit the zoo multiple times a year um, because multiple touch points as we've learned through different studies are more effective for building empathy as opposed to just one um, so uh, that was something that was really cool that came out of my master's plan. Uh, but more impo importantly was probably uh, the wildflower garden that I developed uh, with the sponsorship of the Florida Wildflower Foundation. So it was a grant that I applied for um, through my ACL. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? It's, um, been, a few, it's been a few months now. <laughs> ALC. Yeah, a Author yes. authorship leadership challenge. Yes, yeah. I, had to I had to think about it too. Like, yeah. <laughs> too many, there are too many acronyms in our ACL in our is is in your knee. ALC. Yeah. Yeah. A SL. Um, mm -hmm. my authoritarian um, leadership project, I uh, applied for that grant through the Wildflower Foundation, received those grant funds, and uh, we have a community garden now, and we actually use that community garden space for our camps, uh, so our camp kids, um, our, our camp oh, youth goodness. get to, yeah. um, you know, experience a fully native space, you know, wow. so all of the plants there are native to Florida, so they know are seeing everything from our native milkweeds to our scarlet sages to our ferns uh and our animal collection our ambassador animal collection is specifically curated uh to or to exhibit native animals in florida as well so it's really uh for us building those connections with our youth that you know we have really cool wildlife here in the states um mm. you know while yes you know elephants and tigers and rhinos are, you know, fantastic. And some of my favorite animals, um, we can really focus our efforts into conserving what's in our own backyard. And so through that grant, you know, we have those camp programs. Uh, we do Earth Day programs as well. Uh, so we participate in Party for the Planet uh, and Party for the Planet, uh, or we'll utilize that space for our Party for the Planet celebration uh, in this upcoming April. Uh, so that was a really big part of my master's plan. And the another really big part of it was uh, developing a resource guide for the Eastern Indigo Snake uh, Saving Animals from Extinction uh, plan. So that is a very special program to me because mm -hmm. Eastern Indigo Snakes are one of the species that I have really 
honed in and focused in on, on these last few years. And so I was able to work with one of our local uh, art and design companies here, based here in Florida, uh, in which we were able to create this uh, six page uh, educational resource used for both educators at Susan Aquariums, but also community members as well uh, to educate them on the importance of native snakes. Uh, that can be when you were talking about, you know, uh, human wildlife conflict, I would say I hear more human wildlife conflict with snakes than I do alligators. And oh, so really? that's what, okay. yeah. Uh -huh. And that's mostly because people see a snake and I, I hear it all the time. Oh, I killed that snake. Oh, I got rid of yeah. that snake. Oh, I did this mm -hmm. with that snake. And that is the mindset I want to change. Right. Yeah. I want them to, instead of saying, oh, I some, somehow found a way to get rid of that snake, uh, to changing that to, oh, I found a way to coexist with that snake mm -hmm. in my backyard. Because most of the snakes that we're going to see are going to be our non-venomous uh, variety. That coexistence is possible. Um, whether we can right. relocate them to a more suitable habitat if they are you know, within a complex that has a lot of fragmentation, or mm. maybe even building space within our own properties. You know, there's a lot of land here in Florida that have households that have multiple acres where you can easily uh, create space where snakes will feel comfortable at, but away from your own home um, where they, you won't have that uh, conflict where, you know, you're afraid of your dog's safety or your children's right. safety. Nice. Well, so, I was, yeah. I, I did see that new segment that you were on where you demoed um a, a showed a tarantula it, it was some sort of morning show um yep. clip and you did a, a had a tarantula and then you had the uh is, is it just called an indigo it's an eastern indigo, indigo snake uh, there are indigo multiple snake. indigo yeah. snake varieties um but this one's specifically but so beautiful so maybe if we can um link to that clip um in the in the notes yeah. from this uh because it, it's so cool seeing you demo that and you you let the uh you know the the hosts um hold the back of it and um and then you also bring on alligator and I, I guess maybe all those are are local or or is the um tarantula not native to uh florida or? tarantula was not native but that was a special request gotcha. <laughs> oh really for, they had asked for something fuzzy and furry uh and we actually don't bring our mammals and our birds off oh, property okay. just for their own well-being we feel that bringing reptiles and vertebrates is just it's a it's simpler for those ambassadors uh right. we don't see as high stress levels uh sure. i think that would be a really cool study to look at is like monitoring the stress levels between orders or species of animals going off and off on and off property um but we just right now bring out, bring out reptiles and invertebrates. So that was our I fuzzy preferred. Heard, heard of at least one study. Uh, I believe it was conducted by maybe folks with the Wildlife Conservation Society um, and fennec foxes and looking at stress mm -hmm. levels. And I believe, I, I don't know where it was published or if it was published, um, but they, they did not see any significant with that study, but you never know. I mean, how you analyze that. And I think it's, it is good to be careful and to be um, considering which taxonomic groups might be most amenable to being brought out. Um, fascinating. Well, the indigo snake definitely like just me seeing it. And I was like, that is a beautiful, beautiful animal. Um, yeah. And I could see why people would be, you know, uh, a little intimidated by it. Um, per perhaps uh, if they didn't know um, that it's not venomous and all the benefits it brings and such. Yeah. And, you know, that's a species that is, an, it's an endangered species. And, you know, that's the mm. reason why the safe plan is in place, um, which is widely available for anyone to see on the ACA website or the Saving Animals from Extinction website, where, you know, our goals are to uh, bring awareness uh, to our communities on the importance of these species, uh, but also to engage them as well. And that's what that educational resource, which is actually found on the Alligator Farm website for free, um, where people can learn how to curate or create these areas for wildlife in their backyard, specifically snakes. But obviously this could be um, applied to gopher tortoises or mm. our marsh rabbits or, you know, raccoons, armadillos that we see in our spaces. Very cool. I think of Florida as this whole nother landscape to me with this like mix yeah. of a lot of non-native species, you know, and, and some, some prop ones that are problematic, you know, I think of like, um, what is it? The issue with the invasive, is it like Python. Bernice pythons or, yeah, or Python and boa species down in the yeah. area? 
sense. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. I know these are things that everyone hears about in the popular media, but it, it kind of contributes to your view of Florida. But, um, you know, promoting native species seems especially important to me in Florida, given its unique, you know, ecosystems and, and um, even it's like sort of almost subtropical or close to tropical environment, right? Yeah, and that's why we get so many of those, you know, as you would say, invasive species in our area, because it is one of the southernmost points of our continental U.S. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the wildlife that is nat native naturally found here is expansive, but the wildlife that can survive here is, mm. you know, almost unlimited. And we work that into our programming as well. We actually have a few invasive quote unquote invasive species like veiled chameleons, ball pythons that we use mm. as part of our programming to educate people on the responsibility of the pet trade, right? That's something that we see. Oh I yeah. Kind of touched on that is, you know, everyone wants to have that cool, fun animal until they realize how much work it, it takes to have that cool, fun animal. And right. then they decide, you know, Oh, maybe you, you, you'll be happier outside. Uh, and while that may or may not be the case, you know, ultimately it's not the right thing to do because that animal is going to cause issues for other, other individuals, but more importantly, that animal is not going to have the needs that it ha uh, needs to have met. Well, we were, we were talking about dogs and, and dogs being where it's at in, in many ways. Uh, you've got your, your young golden and a lab, and I've got this young, uh, to be determined, uh, exact breed, <laughs> Hi, <Brent. laughs> uh, uh, both next to us here as we're recording this, uh, podcast. Um, and I've always thought with dragonfly, we, we really have so many people with unique pets, um, and just love of animals. Right. Um, but thinking about, you know, being careful, obviously, and I would think most people in this program are careful about the pets they own, but then to be fair, even a dog, which, uh, you know, maybe has, less of an impact and it's certainly not any you know impact on an exotic pet trade from that standpoint but in terms of a carbon footprint um you know dogs my understanding is they can have quite a footprint so there's there's different ways you can look at the ethics of pet ownership i guess um yeah. think about it cool so um what is what do you see is next for you i mean you're not pursuing a master's on top of your job as you were for a number of years, but you're also involved in so many things now. I mean, are, and and also I'm struck by how you have this conservation focus with your connection with Eastern Indigo Snake and the SAFE program and also are doing so much with education. I mean, do you see yourself getting more involved in one, you know, yeah, over the other or or both or or what? Yeah. So over this last year since graduating, I've really taken the time to um, realign my focus. And so I, during the graduate studies, I've had this kind of yes man approach where it's like, yeah, sure. I'll do it. Yeah, sure. Sign mm -hmm. me up. And so mm -hmm. now it's, you know, um, now that I'm a part of, uh, these different committees or instructional groups, um, finding focus within those to, um, bring the stories that I have created or bringing someone else's stories that they're allowing me to share, uh, and sharing that with the community. Um, so, as I was saying, I'm an instructor for the conservation learning uh, courses um, with AZA. So we have our um, annual course in Leesburg, Virginia, this upcoming February. And so right now, um, a lot of my focus has been on curating uh, with my fellow instructors um, that course to ensure that the content that we bring to the students is relevant, um, but not only relevant, it is something that is they can implement or take back home um, to their own home institutions. And doing that not only with the conservation learning courses, but the crocodilian biology and management courses, and then finding ways to integrate, uh, as you had just said, um, my work with the Eastern Indigo Snake Program, and then my work within the uh, Conservation Education Committee. So it's really taking all of these different um, aspects of my life that I've kind of um, been diving into and bringing them all together with almost one central focus of uh, increasing conservation learning throughout our throughout the different communities that I'm a part of. Um, as you were kind of saying, you know, conservation is something that I'm very passionate about and something that I have really dove almost headfirst into. But I, mm. for me, I don't see the difference between conservation and education. Mm. I see them as almost one and the same. Um, as, you know, in order to conserve the things that we love, we must educate, you know, the people who maybe aren't 
conserving those to love them as well. So it's, um, you know, the, the word conservation is so expansive and it can mean anything from education to animal care and husbandry uh, to even administration and uh, marketing, right? It's it's about how we market our conservation efforts. Um, so people are buying or get the buy-in. So yeah, th these next, I guess that next step for me is really, you know, diving into uh, these different areas or aspects of my work and of my life to uh, truly bring about that kind of conservation first mindset. Awesome. Wow. That's really well said. Um, do you, if, if folks are listening and they want to, you know, find out more about the, the course you're talking about or get in contact with you or the alligator farm, I mean, what do you recommend in terms of best ways to um, reach out or find out more about these things? Yeah. Um, so for, I'll start off with AZA. Um, so AZA has a wonderful website uh, in which, you know, all of their information is there. It is somewhat difficult to navigate because there is so much information there. Uh, but if you go to the professional development tab in the website, um, it's going to list out all of those courses. And those courses, I'm going to give one more spotlight to them because they are fantastic. I took them back in 2018 um, and it definitely changed the trajectory of my um, my career. And so I am a huge um, advocate for them. Uh, but those courses are underneath that professional development tab. Uh, and you can learn everything from, you know, what the content and the goals and outcomes of the course are, to who the instructors are, uh, to what the lodging and what the cost for the, those courses uh, would be. I highly advise if you are um, in the Dragonfly program or if you're at a Zoom Aquarium, you know, reach out to your direct supervisor, reach out to your director to see what kind of funding opportunities are, are available um, or what scholarships are available. AZA does a fantastic job of providing scholarships. And you know, one thing that we do not do as a community enough, and I know this because I've been on the other side of receiving those scholarship requests, is we don't apply for them enough. Um, you know, there is money out there for to be used, um, and it is free money for your education and for your professional development. So I highly, highly, highly advise seeking out those opportunities to uh, further your professional career. Um, so AZA does a great job of hosting um, those on their website. Um, the AZA Network is also a great spot to learn about what's going on, the inner workings. Um, try to join as many communities as you can that are relevant to your um, everyday lives. Uh, those communities, there's a bunch of information in there and don't feel bashful about posting on there either. Um, we are, you know, we're a community of educators and so we're all here to help. Uh, so, you know, what's the saying? There's, there's no dumb questions, right? Mm -hmm. um, other than the ones that you don't ask. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, definitely that's a great place to um, to at least uh, understand, you know, the inner working, workings of AZA. Uh, for the Alligator Farm, uh, if you just go to the Alligator Farm website, um, alligatorfarm.com, uh, you can actually find those Eastern Indigo Snake resources. There are links to our conservation partners, information about Croctoberfest um, or any of those other um, programs that I had discussed here, uh, as well as my contact information. Um, so, you know, that's all readily available there on the website, or you can reach me um, via my social media pages. I'm on Instagram and Facebook. I'm not very uh, prevalent in the social media <laughs> landscape. That's something I'm working on changing, um, but I'm uh, readily, easily, um, easy enough to find there. I, I hope. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Be careful with it, with the, the social media. And it is, it's like you, you want to be out there, but it's also you know, you got to find time and especially I think, you know, as opportunities keep coming to you and, you know, finding time to safeguard your, your uh, ability to reflect and to write and do all the things you want to do, develop those new programs. Um, so anyway, um, but that is great. Those are great resources for everyone. Um, anything else you um want to share any uh, uh, books or uh or a TV or anything you're into, even if it's not directly conservation related. I, I mean, I'm just curious uh, the kind of fun things you're into and also things that are, that you're excited about that are you're continuing to learn from. Yeah. Uh, so gosh, all right. So what am I reading right now? Um, right now I am reading. Um, I'm going back and forth between um, these kind of boring, dry 
um, evaluation books. <laughs> I'm trying to become <laughs> okay. a better evaluator. Um, and so um, I'm not going to call the names because I'm going to butcher them and then I'm not going to do um, them justice. And I could mm. run over to my desk and get them. But, um, you know, right now I'm kind of focusing on, um, you know, being more, um, having a better literacy when it comes to evaluation. Uh, so I do want to specifically call out uh, Dr. Kathy Yoon Khalil's book, uh, Practical Evaluation. Um, it's available on Amazon. Um, that's one I keep going back to because I keep finding intersections between the books that I am reading and the one that she wrote um, or co-wrote. Uh, that one has been um, a guiding resource for me um, so far um, in my studies. Uh, right now, I am, um, you know, venturing into, I'm living in Florida, of course, you know, maybe this is like standard or typical, but I'm, you know, very heavily like uh, enthralled or invested in the pirate culture. Oh, <laughs> and <cool>. so, um, <laughs> yeah, so I have um, been, um, you know, binge watching the show Black Sails uh, for like the uh, second, that's third, been second, on my list third forever. time ever. Been on uh, the list also forever. reading the book Treasure Island. So that's my kind of oh, guilty, nice. yes. And so that's been my guilty pleasure reading. And um so that's you know, that's kind of where I've been in terms of my uh uh blanking on the word, but my cultural um my yeah. cultural readings. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that's black sales and Treasure. I love it. You get you got the assessment and the evaluation uh drug textbooks and then yeah, watching black sales and <laughs> Um, exactly. learning about all that. Well, that's great. Um, but mostly, you know, yeah. I, I am truly an outdoor active person. So, uh, I actually spend most of my time either paddleboarding, paddleboarding or kayaking, hiking. There's a lot of great, uh, trails and areas, um, in this area that I have yet to explore and still exploring, um, going to explore this weekend as well. So, oh, awesome. Yeah. And I see your t-shirt says Raptor run, um, yeah. 3k. Um, what is that? Is that a that's another uh, conservation community event that we host uh, at the Alligator Farm. It's a 3K. It's a small, you know, 1.6 or 1.7 miles, uh, very short, that loops around the um, the neighborhood that surrounds the Alligator Farm. Uh, it's specifically tagged the Raptor Run because it supports avian uh, conservation. So we work with the uh, Avian Research Coalition, uh, research, um, research and Institute. Um, so ARCI, who supports swallowtail kite research. Uh, so they're looking at the migratory patterns of swallowtail kites. Uh, we're also uh, this year going to be working with um, the Audubon Raptor Center um, and supporting the work that they have going on with bald eagles in the area. Uh, so it's uh, named the Raptor Run uh, because of those ties to those uh, raptors uh, that we are supporting. But we also work at the alligator farm, uh, working at the alligator farm or hosted by the alligator farm, have this tie to the prehistoric. Uh, so we have fun with it. We invite um, sponsors like Jeep to uh, be on site where they actually were have, will have their vehicles there. Um, and then, you know, we have, some of our staff have Jeep vehicles that are done out like, you know, the Jurassic, <laughs> the Jurassic Park, Park yep, yeah, vehicles. For yep. sure, gotta uh, do it. So uh, it's a fun kind of gimmicky uh, run. Oh. That, People will dress, come dressed up in their dinosaur inflatable uh, suits or uh, riding dinosaurs <laughs> as they're doing this trot around um, the St. Augustine Alligator Farm. Yeah, that's, you know, and another sub community besides the the pets in Dragonfly would be a running uh, group and especially running in unique places because I know there's uh, some folks that have done like Disney has a a run through the parks uh, annually. Um, this Raptor run sounds amazing at the um, alligator farm. So, I mean, yeah, I think there's a lot of cool options out there for people to run through different zoological um, and, yeah. and natural areas. Um, love it. Okay. Well, this has been amazing, Trevor. Um, thanks so much for, sharing all these unique programs all the things you've done um uh, both within dragonfly and beyond and uh it sounds like uh the alligator farm just like things are just and with aza are just going great um lots of great connections there to keep building on yeah thanks for having me on i really appreciated you know the conversation and i hope you know um for all those listening out there 
um, they find their way to connect with their communities via conservation and education. And uh, please, you know, use myself or uh, really use the whole AZA community as your resource uh, because that's what it is. Awesome. Great. Um, okay. Well, thanks again, Trevor, and uh, have a great day. All right. You as well, Kevin. We'll talk soon. Hi there, folks. Just one more thing before you head on out. If you have a moment, as I mentioned at the beginning, I would love to hear in what ways you are finding this podcast useful, how you listen, what you would like to hear more of, less of, etc. Please feel free to send me any and all feedback, any ideas for guests, etc. to Kevin Madison at my email, which is mattiskc at miamioh.edu. That's spelled M-A-T-T-E-S-K-C at miamioh.edu. Thanks again for listening. Have a great day.